This program is brought to you by the Government Communication and Information System. Yagamugela Mbugeli, this is, of course, the Citizens Connect. Kona Laikaya on SABC2, where you belong. Uh, we have been reflecting on a number of issues as a Shugumezayo in our communities. And I'm Sanji, Ilanga Elinkulu Ngembela, because, of course, it's our last uh, episode for the season. Uh, we have had an incredible time uh, talking, reflecting, crying, laughing with the number of people who have come through through to the studio to share their stories with us, to share the expert opinion on issues that affect us the most. And what better way to wrap up the season with reflecting on issues related to gender-based violence and a femicide. And with me is Dr. Matume Echanaha, who's the deputy chair at Senec. And also joining us in studio is Advocate Praise Kabula, uh, who is from the Department of Justice, Yena Ge Ubuya, from the uh, unit Edila with the promotion of the rights of vulnerable groups. Welcome to the show, Ma. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks to the viewers. I guess Kulume in a gender based violence and mm. femicide as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, in King, of course, that we've been reflecting on throughout the season, yeah, Citizens Connect. Mm. And sis uh, episode I still feel that it's such a broad term and such a broad problem that it's almost hard to dissect Guti I Mklampe nai solution singakalala. Is mm. that how you feel as well? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's quite difficult to get the antidote to gender-based violence and femicide. Actually, there is no country in the world that has actually come up with an antidote. And that is a number of reasons that contribute to that. Uh, patriarchy is one of them. And the fact that there is, uh, it's one, it's one, it's, it's a, it's a, because when you say gender-based violence and femicide, it's a group of, of crimes that constitute that. So, but most of the time it happens behind closed doors. So we have the first one, which is the Criminal and Related Matters Amendment Act, which is a piece of legislation that extends the intermediary services from criminal proceedings to civil proceedings. And the purpose is to basically to assist traumatized women who are coming to court in civil proceedings like applying for a protection order to get intermediary services and so are children and also persons with um, certain persons with disabilities and also the older persons. When you're looking at violence, it doesn't start with the fist, it doesn't start with the rape, it doesn't start with the, uh, you know, the femicide. Mm -hmm. It starts with the socialization, you know. And those are generally socially acceptable behaviors, norms, values that we accept. You know, the whole boys will be boys. So when boys are playing rough, you know, we let them get push away, they push mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when boys, you know, are saying certain things which are in the space of problematic language, we let it go. When they carry certain attitudes that are often rigid in their gender stereotyping, we let it go. And the next then, we also, it is a legislation that says no bail, no police bail. No police bail in matters um, where the perpetrator is, um, is in a domestic relationship with the complainant and also no prosecution bail as well so in those matters then all accused persons must make formal bail applications before the magistrate or the presiding officer we have also um, increased sentences now making them tougher it almost feels like it's too overwhelming because if it has wrong to that point to a point where yeah. Um, we have so much of influence, ka education, this whole notion, yeah, boys will be boys, men don't cry, yeah. is not good when the very same children are being taught that, mm. and so that means 
you know we're not just fo we shouldn't just focus on boys only then it's it's, it's the, the family, family unit the problem is with the family and it was actually proven in 2020 when everybody was in lockdown we had an an increase yes ye sexual offenses perpetrated by children and they are perpetrating the against it they are siblings so there's this there's the huge problem we need to to rehabilitate a family family unit because you cannot say you cannot start by saying that this community is infested with rape for example all right because what builds a community is a family we have also in this piece of legislation recognize for the very first time a sign language because it was not recognized legislatively so now um, uh, a person can actually testify using sign language south africa is a traumatized society mm. um you know um i know there's a we loosely say it but the concept of hurt people hurt people um it's, it's quite rife you know if you look at the number of men who grew up without in dysfunctional fam families and i'm saying that with at most respect, you know, but men who just grew up without their fathers, um, men who, you know, grew up in environments where, you know, there wasn't an optimal socioeconomic, uh, you know, development in that space, um, the kind of patriarchal or hegemonic masculinity descriptions mm -hmm. that we subscribe to men to say men must, daughter must. So, you know, mm. so a lot of men are failing in those masculine traits that we have subscribed to them. And not only have we subscribed to them, men must be strong, and men must be, um, you know, stoicism and mm. be brave in, in, in danger and provider, protector. Um, but we've also have an environment that doesn't even able for men to achieve those. Poverty could be a contributor, but it's not the core driver. Mm. Okay. You know, I can lack, but love my spouse. Mm. All right, and respect her as a woman. So everything, you know, when we talk about gender-based violence, we need to individualize it, this thing. Mm. Because it starts with you. It is you. You are the one who has made that decision. Of course, the environment could be an influence, all right? Mm. But ultimately, you are the one who made a decision to act upon that influence that we have received. The Domestic Violence uh, Amendment Act, um, so with this one, it has introduced a number, it's a myriad of changes. And um, the first is uh, now you can apply online uh, if you are the victim. And um, you apply at your safest place or the place of comfort and make your application for protection order. And you can make that application for protection order um, outside the court hours and the court days, meaning that at any hour of the day, you can make an application for protection order and you will be attended um, your application. There are magistrates and, and clerks of the court and, and police who are on duty um, at that particular time to attend to your protection order. Wonderful. Thank you so much for mm. your time. We'll be back with more after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Sabugele e Citizens Connect. Kona laika ya go SABC to where you belong. Namshanjas kuluma ngezi nini izi ntobeslo gusi reflecta ngazo throughout the season from the criminal justice system to gender-based violence and femicide i ndaba maela ina i crime as well as uunga pepe in our community. So here to help me just round up a number of issues that we have been looking at, particularly related to the criminal justice system is the Director General at the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development or Advocate Doc Mashabane. Baba, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Busi. Uh, where do you think we fare in terms of the state of our criminal justice system? Look, I'm, I'm glad you have raised that. Um, look, you, you obviously look at 30 years and say, what have we done? So. The bedrock of our criminal justice system is the Criminal Procedure Act of 1977. So as you will imagine, that act uh, predates the constitutional era, mm. the constitutional democratic era. 
mm. and it has been amended many times due to either the Constitutional Court or the High Court declaring some sections unconstitutional. But what we have done, we have started a process to overhaul the whole Criminal Procedure Act because it is the bedrock of the whole criminal justice system to look into a number of things. Most critical there is to look at the bail system, look at uh, you know protection of victims. The major complaint has been that uh, our criminal justice system is more focused on the rights of the accused than the rights of the victims. So, so that's what we are looking at. My name is Rudy Dix. I work for the project management office. I lead the project management office in the office of the president. If we don't address crime and corruption, it impacts on investment, it impacts on employment, it impacts on growth. It is important, it's just as a concern for business as it is to only people in society if we don't create jobs. A trust deficit between the community and the criminal justice system, our police, our justice in general. But what we need to understand, and the community must understand this, which is fighting crime is a societal responsibility. Uh, the people who commit crimes in our communities are our uncles, they are our brothers, they are our sons and daughters. So it's our duty, all of us, regardless of how we relate with the person who perpetrates this crime, to come forward. The corruption in King Agakulu especially must be a good thing to entrepreneurs and business in our country. How big of a problem is that? Yeah, co corruption is a big problem and uh, over the years you, you will have seen in terms of the global ranking that uh, the, the country is not doing well uh, and, and part of it as well, FATF downgraded us and part of the reason was uh, corruption and money laundering and so on and so forth. So part of what we are doing as a department uh, over the past year is reviewing the entire anti-corruption architecture. So we have developed a document that uh, is looking at the entire system. So I mean, the first thing is to start with is that I think the Zondo Commission has been an important um, feature of trying to address corruption and the fact that government has to implement those recommendations from the Zondo Commission. Which is very important because every time uh, people hear the word corruption, they almost yes. think it's something that's just up in the air yes. that doesn't affect them yes. uh, personally. Yes. But uh, according to your observation, just even as a, a, a normal citizen, yes. how does corruption affect a normal South African, the average man on the street? You see, so what the average man needs to understand, and basically, you know, corruption and bribery, you know, being more or less the same menace and the same challenge uh, to society. Uh, it starts even with the cold drinks that some, you know, unethical traffic cops on the road when they think that you have violated the rules of the road. Instead of giving you a ticket, uh, then they start asking for a cold drink. And, and South Africans, no South African doesn't know what a cold drink is in relation to a traffic cop. It starts there and it looks like cold drink is small because it's 20 rand, it's 50 rand. But for those who are exposed to billions and millions, a cold drink may mean something else. Now, part of the bigger problem of corruption is that, like I was saying, it affects public service uh, or service delivery. Now, the money that will have been meant to build a school will be diverted to, and, and will no longer be available. Or a school or a road that will have been built for a certain amount, when corruption comes in, it means the amount will be inflated. So instead of building two schools, you will end up with one school. So that's how directly the ordinary man on the street is affected. And in, instead of having initiatives, economic activities that will benefit members of the community, it means those economic activities will not be there. And the economy cannot thrive in an environment that is riddled with corruption. Mm. And when the economy doesn't thrive and doesn't grow, it will mean that we cannot succeed in fighting unemployment. So you will have many people unemployed, uh, you will have many people on the streets because those resources, uh, you know, they are not endless and they are supposed to be utilized in an effective way to bring development to our communities, to bring improvement to the, a better life for the ordinary person on the street. Mm. I mean, what's important is that the 30 years shows that 
you know, in, in democracy, we've made huge amounts of progress. I think many people forget that. But I think 30 years later, you'd expect us to be able to move quite significantly forward on a whole set of different areas. So crime and corruption is quite important. We have to progress and make sure that we deal with some of the recommendations that, are, that have come out of the Zondo Commission, of course. Um, for instance, the independence um, of the independent directorate, right? Um, investiga sorry, investigative directorate, um, a number of other um, supporting measures for the National Prosecuting Authority to be able to get many of the crimes during, uh, during state capture to be prosecuted and for those to of course have the day in, in court and, and to be you know and to and to and to be dealt with uh, we need to have those levels of accountability a lot of work is required a lot of capacity is required both in the police services and the prosecution of prosecuting authorities this is ongoing work that we need to carry through any money that we see on newspaper headlines that X amount of hundreds of millions or billions has been stolen, the ordinary man must understand that this is the money that should have come to build a clinic or a hospital in my locality. This is the money that should have assisted with waste remover. This is the money that should have come to assist with sanitation and water. Um, so, so, so that's what the corruption does all over the world, that it affects, it, it's, it stalls development. Mm. And in fact, it reverses any gain in our country. It reverses the gains of democracy. It reverses the gains of whatever efforts that were put in place in order to develop this country to improve uh, services, public service in general. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Nkela Ogutu, you always equal drink here, and no, I'm not bribing you. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to stay tuned because more is coming up after the break. Obugele, your citizens cannot. Stay with us. It's important to know that government is doing something, right? So we're not just sitting on our laurels, right? We're not just sitting and uh, uh, making promises. Uh, this is the reason why the president has set up this office. And uh, we have a strong team, a team that is working on supporting delivery across different areas that are critical for growth. And I think that's really the message that um, I know it's um, difficult to say to people, um, we are going to deliver, we are going to do this. People are tired of hearing that. People want to know that we've delivered on this and we've delivered on that. The Bila Bila uh, Communal Property Association is a land restitution you know, program which happened as a result of that program of land claims under land reform. So after we received back the land, we did, you know, organize ourselves and then partnered with some, you know, knowledgeable people. And then we started, you know, business entities like, you know, poultry, you know, the game farm, what's the name, cattle production and, and so forth. And then Project A, when you change your life, how do you do it? I do Project A. Every month every month the most important thing even le metsi re a thutsa ha ka metsi ka hore ha re palwa go bona metsi mo re ka bona nte then re khona go go bana le mata re khona go tsa se re na le sona re khona go tlela metsi e se leng gore ka borona ne re ka se se khone re thutsa ke this community ka bela bela cpa this, this project and mm. so it's quite important for the community uh, it should be protected as well yes mm. farmers don't necessarily want everything to be done they need land they need support they need agricultural agricultural support programs and these are the kind of things that we need to provide for them so that they're able to form access to markets also that's quite important that we create that environment for them to get access to markets and for them to be able to sell the produce we pride ourselves in what we do. We, we, are, we are very proud, but the third thing is, as a community, as the 250 families, as the trucks move from the farms and go into the villages, uh, 
I remember when the dispossession happens, you know, people were scattered all over, you know, the country. Mm. So where our people are collecting their food parcels on a monthly basis in a particular village, some members of the villages are not part of this group. So they feel like they, they, they were part because they, 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 they also want to participate mm. or actually get you know, a little of what other people are getting, but unfortunately it's not possible because, you know, the resources are not, you know, uh, enough to. Mm. To, to, yeah, to support everybody. How important having certain programs and we always sanganisa in a formal way in a community towards some sort of economic recovery. I mean, you guys are part of the economic uh, reconstruction and recovery plan. Ili tu sitze juang. Yeah, it just actually help us in many ways. Uh, if we could uh, talk about, you know, the poultry plant. We are having, you know, a plant in Bilabila, which is, you know, a state of the art that we have built ourselves, you know, through, you know, the assistance of government. Uh, we're having about, you know, 120,000 chickens or birds. We are producing 110,000 eggs every day. Mm. So we've got, you know, an offtake, you know, agreement. So all our eggs goes to the big retailers. So in a way, we are, we are contributing, you know, to the food security of this country. So there are really good programs that we can do and we can collaborate with and we can get, um, you know, many people out there earning various forms of income through either getting a job, farming, being self-employed, running a business or any other form of economic activity. And that's really what we need to do. And that's what we need to create. We need to create an entrepreneurial society where young people, are, and particularly young people, can, can benefit as a result of it. Oh, amazing. Yes. Amazing. I think let's end it there. It's, it's, <laughs> it's you know, amazing to hear your story and how you, you are empowering other people yeah. and doing it yeah. in a way yes. that is benefiting everyone. That's how we wrap up the first season of uh, Citizens Connect. I cannot believe Uguti says figure it, but we had an opportunity to just sit down with South Africans, almost like having an imbizo of some sort, yeah. where we look at, you know, the challenges that we face face in our communities, possible solutions. It's been an absolute um, just honor to share those stories and bring you those stories. It wasn't only about the challenges and the hardships that people go through, but also the lighter topics as well. Innovative entrepreneurs coming on and sharing their ideas. Uh, people who are resilient, irrespective of the challenges that we face, like load shedding uh, and the economic problems that we deal with as South Africans. So, see Nigella Gini as South Africans to just take on the battle and make sure, Oguti, you make that change. From me, Nabusisiwa Kumete Chijanje, Gintanda Gakulu, thank you so much for staying with us throughout the season. Mm -hmm.